Hi everybody and welcome back to INTR 101. So today we're going to be talking about presentation management, which just means how do we give really effective presentations for folks? Uh, what does that look like? How do we prepare and how do we actually present? So um, again, terrible meme, but I do love memes and that's the first thing. For this class, I try and make it laid back. So this is sort of appropriate, but if you're giving a really professional presentation, probably shouldn't add too many memes to it. Uh, so first presentation management tip. So what I want you to think about really quick right now is what makes a good presentation? What are the attributes of the speaker, of the presenter, um, and the actual presentation itself that make it engaging and make you want to actually learn something from it? Uh, so keep that in mind as we go through an example of what not to do. So what I'm going to do is I've made a presentation that is terrible and um, I want you to think about as I go through it what things are wrong with it, what's awful, hopefully it's a little bit funny, um, but just keep that in mind. So without further ado, I present to you chemtrails. Wake up. What are chemtrails? So they're like aerosoled, released, I'm sorry, the technology is really wonky here. Let me try this again. Okay, so they're like aerosols that are released by planes and they contain uh, just stuff that's like not good. Um, and it, it's like, it's really bad for you and it like gets in you and it's just like not cool. Um, but they have nothing to do with planes or anything like that. Like that's not, that's not real. Chemtrails are super different than trains and they're like in a grid and it's just really bad sorry distracted anyway um so chemtrails are not contrails chemtrails like they're they're the bad thing contrails um come from planes but they can't happen at low altitudes so like you know it's just not a thing um that that really happens um Anyway, yeah, chemtrails, not contrails. So why? Well, that's pretty simple. The, the why behind it is definitely um, like full, full control of the population. Um, yeah, that's... Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I totally forgot that my mic was muted. Whoops, sorry about that. Anyway, um, so there's all these bad things that it does. Um, but yeah, you might think that it's, it's this, but it's not. And like, it's obviously the Illuminati. And just like, look at these pictures. They totally tell you. Um, so... Yeah, so how do you protect yourself? Well, cilantro and all of these different things can really help you to stay healthy and, and safe. Uh, so, so you should take these. Okay, so <laughs> what was wrong with that presentation? Um, a couple of things that you might have noticed are that the colors were awful. So when you're making a presentation, you want to make sure that it's visually appealing just as much as the, inner, as the information is appealing. Uh, so having really intense contrasting colors is actually really hard for people to see uh, and can make it difficult to engage with the presentation. Um, you might have noticed that the sound cut out for a while uh, because I wanted to talk about like, if you're on a Zoom call, make sure that you're unmuted. Um, or, you know, if you're giving a presentation in person, make sure that you're speaking clearly. Uh, you might have noticed that I got distracted by what's outside my window. Uh, my camera at one point was only showing the top half of my head uh, and another point was showing like just my neck down, which is a little weird. Um, so make sure that all of these aspects are not something that you're doing during a presentation. Um, if I would have thought ahead, I would have had someone walk behind me awkwardly. 
Um, so these are all sorts of things that I see on Zoom presentations that really make them less professional and make it harder for folks to stay engaged. So we're going to kind of talk through all of the different things that go into a good presentation and how we could theoretically improve the one that you just saw. So first and foremost, you want to make sure that you're presenting with confidence. So in order to do that, you want your presentation really clear and easy to follow for yourself and for everyone else involved. So keep your presentation clean and legible. Make sure you're checking for any grammatical errors ahead of time uh, so that you don't trip yourself up and so that everyone else sees a clear presentation as well. Make sure you're providing the essential information. So on that presentation that I just did, there were just like blocks of text that weren't useful, that I didn't cover, that didn't seem to be essential. So for the bullet points on your slides, make sure you're sticking to what's really important. Now, depending on the context, you might need to include a little bit more information. So whenever I'm presenting online, I always include probably more bullet points than I need, just because you never know what someone's internet quality might be like, and they might have a hard time hearing me present on their device. Uh, and then lastly, avoid distractions. So when you're giving a presentation, you want to make sure that you can be as engaged as possible as well. So, you know, try to get rid of any pre-made slide backgrounds that are super distracting that might cause you to get lost. Uh, if you're presenting online, do so in a space that's not super distracting for yourself. Um, and all of those sorts of things will go into giving you a really good presentation. So you may be wondering, like, why not use pre-made slide backgrounds? And the main reason is that a lot of slide backgrounds are super busy and hard to follow. Um, so the ones that have like really intense, like super bright colored background gradients um, and a lot of extra stuff going on are just hard to pay attention to because there's so much stuff on them. If you find a really good simple pre-made background, then that's awesome. So you'll notice that all of the slides throughout this entire class that I have um, all use the same background and it's the U of I one that you can download. And presentation backgrounds like this are professional and okay because they're really simple. They don't have a lot of extra frills. They just make your presentation look really cohesive. And because I'm a member of the university, it's good for me to use the university branding. Um, so you may run into that in future jobs or, you know, there may be a template that your professor provides for you. So just make sure you use something that's clean and easy to follow. So providing a strong presentation takes practice, right? This isn't something that you can just like master overnight. So how do you get sort of that confidence and that, that strong presentation skill? Well, the first thing is you want to make sure that you know your presentation and that you know the information. So practice it. Go over it a lot to make sure you're really confident about what you're presenting on. And then understand the requirements of the presentation that you're giving. So you might have a time constraint or a format constraint. Um, if it's for an assignment, there might be a really specific goal of that presentation. So knowing what everyone else is looking for in your presentation is critical for giving a good one. And then make sure that you're knowledgeable in the technologies that you use. So if you're giving your presentation over Zoom, make sure you practice it over Zoom once or twice beforehand so that you're comfortable with being able to share your screen, navigate um, between different pages, turn on and off the video or like your microphone, and just feeling good about all of that different technology. And then create some safeguards if possible. So if you aren't able to give it really well over Zoom for whatever reason, maybe internet goes out or something like that, you could send everyone a PDF of your presentation beforehand so they have it as a backup. Um, this is also great to do if you're giving presentations in person. Yes, save it in PowerPoint, but also save it as a PDF and maybe save it on a share drive somewhere just so that you have multiple ways to access that presentation. You know, like email it to yourself, bring in a paper copy of it if needed. That way, if technology goes awry or something happens, you always have that backup for yourself. 
Now, when you're actually giving the presentation, make sure you're prepared. So come with whatever it is that you need. Uh, this might be note cards, an outline, or the actual slides printed out for yourself. Now, one thing to keep in mind is you don't want to have these printed out slides like up in front of your face because that prevents you from connecting with the audience. Uh, but make sure you have those things with you that you need. And then when you're actually presenting, take on the role of an orator. And what that means is to speak clearly, face your audience, make eye contact, and dress appropriately. So we're going to go through some of those. When I say speak clearly, that just means don't speak into the board, right? So the worst thing uh, for presentations is when someone is facing the board directly and just talking straight at the screen. And that makes it really hard for anyone to hear what they're saying, and it makes it hard to connect with the speaker. So that's why you wanna face your audience. Now, when it comes to making eye contact, that's a little easier to do in person, but it can be really challenging to do over Zoom. So it's important if you're giving a presentation over Zoom to look directly at your camera because that will show up as looking directly at the participants. Now, obviously you can look down from time to time to check and see you know, where you are in your presentation and that's no big deal at all. You'd be doing that in person as well. But try to make sure that you are connecting with the camera throughout the presentation so folks feel engaged. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're dressing appropriately, whatever that looks like for the environment. So if you're giving a presentation in class and your instructor has said like, hey, don't worry, there's no dress code for it, then just wear, you know, what makes you feel comfortable um, while also being semi-professional in some context, right? You don't want to go like full onesie um, just because that isn't the most professional, even though there isn't necessarily a uh, dress requirement for it. If they say business professional for something, then make sure you're following those guidelines. Um, personally, I like to dress up just a little bit whenever I give a presentation because it helps me feel a bit more confident. So if you haven't tried that before, maybe it's something to try out. And then this final point that I have is no slide karaoke. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it just means don't stare at your slides and read directly line by line what's on them. Uh, sometimes it may sound like I'm doing that in these presentations, but that's because I've given them a lot, so I kind of have it memorized. Um, but when you're giving a presentation for the first time, if you're just staring at the slide and reading it off line by line, that really reduces the engagement with the audience and makes it hard for folks to kind of stay in the moment and with you throughout the material. So you also want to be prepared to answer any questions. So more often than not, a presentation comes with some sort of Q&A right afterwards. So when folks are asking you those questions, you know, actively listening to what they're saying is going to help you answer those questions better. And then you can use the question to frame your response. And this does a couple of things. One, it shows that you were listening to what the person was asking. And two, it helps keep you on track, because I know when I'm answering questions, I can kind of go off on a tangent. So using the audience member's question to frame how I respond helps keep me on track and make sure that I actually answer their question fully. A uh, couple of other things, make sure to treat every question with respect. That may seem like a silly thing to remind you all of. Um, but I have definitely been in presentations where folks scoffed at really simple questions that were asked by the, by the audience. And that isn't helpful. It doesn't make you look good. It makes the person who asked it feel really terrible. Um, and there might be 17 other people in the audience who have the same question. And now they've just checked out because they realize that, well, there's no point in me asking questions because I'll just be made to feel dumb. So make sure you know, even the most basic questions are treated with respect um, and with kindness. And then make sure to thank the audience for their time. Uh, you know, it's always just a nice little thing of saying like, hello, th or thank you all for, you know, inviting me to this presentation. I really appreciate the time today um, or anything like that. And again, and it's just a little professional tweak that you can give that really steps up your presentation. So the next type of presentation we're gonna talk about are poster presentations, which some of you may have experienced already, some of you may not have, um, and some of you might not ever have to give them, but it is something that I like to talk about. So a poster presentation session 
is really common uh, in graduate schools and for any folks that are doing research. And basically what you do is you condense your research or your topic of study down to a poster. You pin it up and then folks walk through and check out all these different posters of all of these different research projects. So um, oh, there we go. A couple of tips when it comes to poster presentations is you will have a very varied audience, um, both in knowledge and in attention. So normally at these presentations, it might be some really broad thing, like maybe it is the you know, regional conference for art and architecture. So you're gonna have folks in a lot of different disciplines presenting and attending this um, conference. So as they walk through the poster presentation, they may not connect with your poster because it's just not in their field of study. Or they may be asking a lot of really simple questions, again, because maybe they don't have a lot of expertise in that area. Uh, but you might also run across someone who this is their field of study and they're going to have some really high level questions for you about your presentation. So you've got to be able to adapt that presentation to all of the different folks that are coming by. The number one thing about poster presentations is be prepared to repeat yourself because you're constantly going to have folks coming up at different points in your kind of like go-to spiel. So you're gonna have to restart for some folks, um, repeat yourself just a lot about some of the key uh, important details on your poster. And then see any of the materials that you bring as conversation starters. So maybe you have a printout of a recent article that you wrote. Number one, bring a lot of them. And number two, be prepared to talk in depth about those, but they can also be a nice way to get people interested in your presentation, right? You can hand someone something and then dive into it with both the material there and what's on your poster. And then be prepared to answer really common questions. So usually after the first 10 minutes or so, you start to see a pattern in what people are asking, and you can start to incorporate that information in your kind of go-to talk that you're giving. Uh, but you might still get questions around that material, so just be ready for those really common things. Um, some of those things might include definitions or explanations of your methodology, things like that. And then you want to focus on creating a dialogue. So what's really nice about poster presentations versus like a slideshow presentation is they're a lot more conversational. So you can have somebody come up and maybe they're in a field that's sort of tangential to what you're doing. And you can have a really great dialogue about how your work and their work might fit together. And you might have a totally different conversation in a different aspect of your material with the next person that comes up. So really focusing on connecting with the folks there and doing so in a really personal manner is a great way to ensure a really great poster presentation. So I like to include an example. This is just one example of how to do an academic poster presentation. Um, this is pretty standard for STEM fields. It looks different from field to field. So check in with faculty about what looks normal in your, in your field um, and how you would set up a poster for that. A couple of things to include are easy to follow graphs or visuals. So Posters are really nice if they have a couple of things that are like, oh, I can clearly see this table or this flowchart or this graph. Um, so if you can include those, make sure that they're kind of visually separated, visually attractive for people. Um, use a clear and easy to read font uh, because folks are gonna be trying to read through this poster. You wanna make it easy on the eyes. And then don't forget your citations. You just pop in your references at the bottom or at the top, whatever makes the most sense for this. And then also include some contact information so that if folks really connected with your poster and wanna learn more about it, they can contact you later to do that. So the last thing I wanna do is end with a more professional example of a presentation. So this is based off of the old final project that we used to do in INTR 101. So students were given the prompt of, for the final presentation, select a college success strategy featured in your action plan. In your presentation, address the following. How is this useful? How have you changed or improved this strategy? And how would you talk about this strategy with others? So let's first talk about what the actual expectations for this presentation are. 
So I need to include a college success strategy. I need to talk about why it's useful to me, how I changed it, and then how I would talk about it with other folks. So it's pretty clear four items. Uh, also included on this grading rubric are, you know, standards of professionalism. You want the you want the presentation to look professional, uh, and I wanted to look professional as I gave it. So what I'm going to go through and do is give an example of this presentation, and then we'll talk about it at the end. So here we go. Hi, my name is Kelly Christensen, and I'm going to talk about critical reading for scientific articles. So how do you make a scientific article easier to comprehend? Because the language is pretty dense and difficult. So scientific articles can be very challenging um, for understanding. And I asked myself, is there a systematic way to read these papers that makes them easier to digest? And the answer is yes, and it's all about critical reading. So in order to better understand the article that you're reading, you need to make sure that you read with purpose, which is one of the things that we talked about for critical reading in this class. But when it comes to scientific articles specifically, you should really focus on changing up the order of how you read it. So generally, the most important information for a scientific article is located at the beginning and the end. And we tend to get lost in the details when we try to read straight through the article. So understanding the big picture first can help us understand all of the details later. And to do this, we need to make sure that we're not afraid to read out of order. So my order of operations for reading a scientific article is to first tackle the abstract in the introduction. This is going to give you the big picture and it's gonna introduce you to all of the big ideas of the paper. Then I'm going to jump ahead to the conclusion because I want to know what it is that the researcher actually found. Once I have that knowledge, I can start to read all of the other sections with a clear understanding of where they're leading to. So after reading the conclusion, I jump to the background section. And this is going to give me some of the previous information that the researchers used to inform their study. Then I go through the analysis and the methods to actually understand how they did their whole project and where their results came from. So what I've done here is that I've given myself a really broad overview and then gone down to the nitty gritty details. And I feel much more confident in the information when I read in this way. So this method contextualizes the experiments that you are trying to understand. And an understanding the endpoint of the experiment can help you understand the steps that the researchers took to get there. Reading this way initially can make a second read through easier. So I tend to read scientific articles twice. I read them once completely out of order, and then I read them through from start to finish. So I understand that big picture, then I get the details, and then I can read the story all the way through without getting too lost. So I'm going to have you all try it out. Um, I'm going to give you a paper, and I want you to find the main goal of the experiment, the major results, and the structure of the model. So like, time out. This is what I would have done when I'm presenting in class as I give this to everybody. And this is the way that I engage and I demonstrate how I discuss this method with other folks. So thank you all for taking some time to come to my presentation on critical reading. Do you have any questions? Okay, so that's an example of a very straightforward professional presentation. Um, so I want you to think about, you know, did I cover all of the objectives from the prompt? I discussed what the critical or what the college success strategy was, how I changed it, so how I adapted critical reading to fit my needs better. Um, and then the way in which I said I would discuss it with other students is by doing a demo right there in the presentation. So was the presentation professional? Hopefully you found it professional. Uh, the slide backgrounds were very clear and consistent. Uh, there may have been a grammatical error, who knows? Hopefully you saw it. Um, and then what could have been better? So when I've given this presentation in the past, a lot of students have said, you should really include some pictures. And I agree, some nice visual aids are really helpful throughout a presentation. The one thing you want to make sure is to not give too many or make them too busy. Because when you have a lot of pictures and things on a presentation, 
folks are really easily distracted by those and kind of tune out what you're actually saying. So make sure you find that balance for yourself and for your presentation. Alrighty, so with that, we are going to hop over to BB Learn and discuss real quick what we've got going on there. So if you head over to the weekly content and go to our week number six, um, things are loading. There we go. Okay. Uh, so you'll see the feedback presentations. This video will be going up for presentation management. Uh, and then you've got a presentation management deliverable. So it is just a quick little um, quiz type of thing. Uh, so like some of our other deliverables, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, you're just going to talk about, you know, do you enjoy giving presentations? What is the hardest part of developing a presentation? And then I want you to reflect on a presentation that you saw or attended that you really enjoyed. And I want you to think about what made it enjoyable, what did the presenter do to actually make that material engaging. All right. So with that, I hope you all have a really lovely day. Uh, stay warm out there, stay safe out there, and I will talk to you all soon. Bye.